Sutra. When Ananda and the Great Assembly heard the Buddha's instructions, they became peaceful and composed both in body and mind. They recollected that since time without beginning, they had strayed from their fundamental true mind by mistaking the shadows of their causally conditioned differentiating mind as something real and substantial. Now on this day, when they had awakened to such illusions and misconceptions, like a lost infant who rejoiced its beloved ma mother after a long separation, they put their palms together to make obeisance to the Buddha. Commentary When Ananda and the Great Assembly heard the Buddha's instructions, when Ananda and the great Bodhisattvas, the great Ahas, and the great Bhikkhus, and the others heard this teaching, they became peaceful and composed both in body and mind. Their bodies and minds felt extremely comfortable, so that they didn't feel the least bit of pain. They had never felt better. They had never known anything so fine. But at the same time, they recollected that since time without beginning, they had strayed from their fundamental true mind by mistaking the shadows of their causally conditioned differentiating minds as something real and substantial. From time without beginning, they had renounced their basic mind and had used only their false mind, their consciousness, conscious mind, their mind which makes distinctions in order to do things. They hadn't understood external states. They'd taken their false thinking mind to be true and natural. They had engaged in false activity at the gates of the six organs and had the least bit of skill when it came to the self nature. In order to function, they dealt it exclusively with the false thinking mind, the attached mind, the arrogant mind, the mind which assesses upon conditions, the mind which is false, which is false in various kinds of ways. Now on this day, they had awakened to such illusions and misconceptions, like a lost infant who rejoiced its beloved mother after a long separation. They put their palms together to make obeisance to the Buddha. They had been like a hungry child who had no milk to drink. It had been very painful. All of a sudden, the child's compassionate mother had returned, and the child had milk to drink. That is what it, what it was like for the assembly when they awakened upon hearing the Buddha's instruction. They placed their palms together and bowed to the Buddha to thank him for his kindness in bestowing the Dharma upon them. Sutra, they wished to hear such words from the first come one as to enlighten them to the dual nature of body and mind, what is false and what is real what is empty and what is substantial, what is subject to production and extinction, and what transcends production and extinction. Commentary Why did the assembly bow to the Buddha? Because they wished to hear such words from the first come one as to enlighten them to the dual nature of body and mind. They wanted him to uncover it and portray it clearly to reveal what is false and what is real what is empty and what is substantial. There is the true and the false, the empty and the actual, and they wanted the Buddha to teach them to recognize each of them. They wanted him to reveal what is subject to production and extinction and what transcends production and extinction, to reveal the mind's dual nature, the mind with superficial production and extinction, and the mind that is not subject to production and extinction. What is the mind of production and extinction? It is the conscious mind, our mind which seizes upon conditions by turning to the outside and seeking there instead of developing skill of the self-nature. What is the mind not subject to production and extinction? You must apply your skill to the self-nature and understand the mountains, the rivers, the great earth, the vegetation, and all the myriad appearances and are all the Dharma body of all Buddhas. The Dharma body of all Buddhas is neither produced nor extinguished, and the pure nature and bright substance of everyone's permanently dwelling true mind 
is also not produced and not extinguished. Why do we have production and extinction, birth and death? It is because we do not recognize the pure nature and bright substance of the permanently dwelling true mind. It is also because your mad mind has not ceased. So it is said, when the mad mind ceases, that ceasing is the body. The mad mind stopping itself is the manifestation of your body mind. Because the mad mind exists and has not ceased, the body mind cannot come forth. The mad mind covers it over. What is being explained now and in every other passage of sutra text without exception has the aim of revealing everyone's true mind. Sutra. Then King Prasenna Yit rose and said to the Buddha, In the past, when I had not yet received the teachings of the Buddha, I met Katiyayana and Varatiputra, both of whom said that this body is annihilated after death and that this is Nirvana. Now, although I have met the Buddha, I still have doubts about their words. How much I wish to be enlightened to the ways and means to perceive and realize the true mind, thereby proving that it transcends production and extinction. All those who have our flows also wish to be instructed on this subject. Commentary Then, before the Buddha spoke, King Prasenayit rose in the Great Assembly. King Prasenayit's name means moonlight in Sanskrit as mentioned before. The king was born at the same time that the Buddha entered the world. Upon entering the world, the Buddha emitted light, but King Prasenayit's father thought that it was his son who was emitting the light as he came into the world, so he named him Moonlight. King Prasenayit said to the Buddha, In the past, when I had not yet received the teachings of the Buddha, I met Katiyana and Varitiputra. Before I received the benefit of the Buddha's teaching and transforming, I believed in external paths. He believed in the annihilationism of Katiyayana. Katiyayana is a Sanskrit name which is interpreted to mean cut hair because formerly those who followed this external path did not cut their hair or their fingernails so were called the long-nailed external path. Vairatiputra means son of Vairati. Vairati was his mother's name. The name is interpreted to mean does not do. What he didn't do were good deeds, but he had no hesitation about doing bad deeds. Both of whom said that his body, this body is annihilated after death and that this is Nirvana. They say that after this body dies, there isn't anything. There is no cause and there is no effect, no future lives and no former lives. Basically, the person, a person's death is like a putting out a lamp is gone. There isn't anything at all. Everything is annihilated. Annihilation means that there is no soul, no awareness, no nature, nothing at all. And that's what they call Nirvana. That's what annihilationists mean by not produced and not extinguished. Since there's nothing, there isn't any production or extinction. That's how the external paths talk. But I will tell you all that that is a grave mistake. When people die, they are not annihilated. So it is just at this point where the distinction between Buddhism and external paths lies. Some external paths talk about annihilation and some talk about permanence. One advocates annihilation, the other advocates externalism, and both kinds confuse people most seriously. Now, although I have met the Buddha, I still have doubts about their words. The Buddha has come into the world and has come to teach and transform me, but I still have folks like doubts and do not believe the doctrine spoken by the Buddha. He still feels that people are annihilated when they die and that their ceasing to exist is nirvana. Doubts are said to be folks-like because the folk spirit is doubtful by nature. 
No matter what you say, he doesn't believe it. For example, when a fox walks across the ice in winter, he takes one step, stops, cups his ear and listens, and then takes another step and cups his ear to listen. If he hears the ice cracking, he immediately retreats. He knows that if the ice cracks, it is not thick enough to and could send him plunging into the river. He's extremely intelligent. So it is said of an intelligent person, he is as smart as a folk spirit. He has a lot of doubt in his mind and is up to argue. He opposes everyone, no matter who, and is always on the defensive like a fox. How much I wish to be enlightened to the ways and means to perceive and realize the true mind, thereby proving that it transcends production and extinction. All those who have outflows also wish to be instructed on this subject. How can I come to know the German doctrine of no production and no extinction and realize my mind which is not produced and not extinguished? Everyone in the assembly who has not obtained the spiritual penetration of the extinction of outflows wishes to understand this doctrine. To have outflows is to flow into the three realms, into the desire realm, the form realm, and the formless realm. When people flow there, they undergo birth and death. Those who have not ended birth and death are called people without flows. So everyone in the assembly who had not certified to the fruit and still had our flows, wanted to understand the doctrine of no production and no extinction, so that they could all perceive their true minds, be enlightened, and end their outflows. Sutra, the Buddha said to the great king, Now I ask you, as it is now, is your physical body like Vira, indestructible and living forever, or does it change and go bad? Want or no one? This body of mind will keep changing until it eventually becomes extinct. Commentary In this section of text, the Buddha asks the king whether the king's body will decay, and the king answers that it will decay completely. The Buddha said to the great king, Now I ask you, as it is now, is your physical body like a vira, indestructible and living forever? If we just Consider your flesh body, is it as durable as a vara? Is it eternally indestructible like a vara jewel or a diamond? Or does it change and go bad? In the last analysis, what is it like? Is it possible to destroy it? Tell me. World or not one, this body of mind will keep changing until it eventually becomes extinct. Upon hearing the Buddha's question, King Prasenayit replied without hesitation. Won't honored one, this body of mine will eventually go completely bad. Eventually it will be finished, that is for certain. Sutra, the Buddha said, Great King, you have not yet become extinct. How do you know you will become extinct? Commentary, in answer, the Buddha said, Great King, you have not yet become extinct. You aren't dead yet. How do you know that in the future you will die? You haven't become extinct yet. So what enables you to know that you will keep changing until you become extinct? Tell me, how does it happen that you know so much doctrine? Sutra, World Honored One, although my impermanent changing and decaying body has not yet become extinct, I observe it now and every passing thought fades away. Each new one fails to remain, but gradually perishes like fire turning to ashes. This perishing without cease convinces me that this body will eventually become completely extinct. Commentary King Prasenayit replied, World on one. Although my impermanent changing and decaying body has not yet become extinct, I observe it now, although it is not dead yet. This body of mine is not eternal, but at least it will last only 80 or 90 years. At the very most, it won't last more than a 100 years. Observe means that he contemplated it in general and in detail, inside and outside. 
from front to back and close up and from a distance. I look at others and look at myself. Other people die and I am the same as they are. Every passing thought fades away. Now I regard his mind within and sees that each thought flourishes as the next thought arises. The one replaces the other and is replaced by the next in turn. They are just like waves. Although I cannot see them, they seem like waves which arise ceaselessly. One wave upon the next, they are continually changing and dying out. Each new one fails to remain but gradually perishes. A thought does not remain forever as a new thought comes up. The one preceding it disperses and none can last eternally. It is the same as when incense is lit, like a fire turning to ashes. The ashes fall and the fire reappears, but then, after a short while, the ashes once again cover the fire. The ashes represent the old, the fire is the new, but the new is continually unendingly turning to ashes. The ashes fall bit by bit and turn into dust and disappear. This perishing without cease convinced me that convinced me that this body will eventually become completely extinct. So I am absolutely certain without any question that in the future my body will return to extinction. Sutra, the Buddha said, so it is. Commentary Shakyamuni Buddha tells the king that he has explained it correctly. Every passing thought fades away and will eventually become completely extinct.